apologize that I'm used to a very US-centric audience. Um, so hopefully I've adjusted it um, for y'all being more progressive types here. So thank you for that. Feels like family already. Um, so I am going to ask everybody to keep an open mind to the things that I'm talking about. Because when I'm talking about all this stuff, I'm not asking activists of anything that you're working on to give up your passion. If you're an animal rights activist and you're working on anti-vindisection work, when I'm talking about here, I'm not saying, oh, you shouldn't be working on that. What I'm asking for is for us to try and be a little bit more consistent and more aware of the choices that we make in our lives and the things that we say as activists that we need to be aware of how they impact others and other social justice movements that are taking place. So as we all know, there's a common link between all oppressions. It is the vulnerable who get oppressed, whether it's animals, women, workers, or people of color. It's those who are seen without power or without a voice are the ones that get oppressed. Most of us can figure out one of the biggest incentives for oppression, and that's profit, and that's capitalism. That too often we think uh, things that normally wouldn't stand up to scrutiny somehow get a pass because it's for profit. Because the capitalist system has created a situation where it's okay to oppress, kill, and exploit other living beings. And somehow it's okay because it's for money. Food Empowerment a Project encourages everybody to extend their circle of compassion. As animal activists, we often ask people who are not activists in the animal realm to extend their circle of compassion. What we like to ask animal activists to do is extend your circle of compassion to human animals and think about how human animals are treated, uh, more specifically for Food Empowerment Project, for the food that you eat. As vegans, we often talk a lot about we, ha we have the most compassionate lifestyle. We eat in the most compassionate way possible. And that's not necessarily the case. I don't have time to go into a lot of environmental justice issues here. So what I'm going to talk about are some areas that we focus on in our work more specifically and tangibly. One of it is that how we talk about how our diet is very compassionate, it's cruelty-free, and yet our diet is based on fruits and vegetables that are picked at the hands of farm workers. Farm workers who vast majority of even the produce that comes to Canada, in fact, globally, comes from the state of California, which is where I live. Farm workers who are dying in the fields because of heat. There are approximately three, oh sorry, I always get this in the list, three million farm workers in the U.S. Approximately 400,000 of those farm workers are children. We're talking children as young as five years old picking blueberries. They work long hours. They don't have benefits that other workers would have, in the, even in the U.S. system, which we don't have a lot of rights for our workers. Um, they work 8 to 14 hours a day. They're exposed to agricultural chemicals, chemicals that not only impact the workers as they're working, but pesticide drift that then impacts the kids when they're in, at their bus stops, when they're at school. It contaminates their water supply. We have labor camps in California where about 12% of the population of farm workers live. These are located, at least the one I've been to, is what I call an environmental injustice area, which is located between a correctional facility and a dump. These people pick our foods. <laughs> Especially if you're vegan, they pick our foods. And yet, they have none of the basic rights. They don't have access to the fruits and vegetables that they're picking themselves. And this is a serious problem. This is, you know, there's downright slavery taking place in the United States. Hopefully a lot of you are familiar with the coalition of Immokalee workers. All they're trying to get is a penny more per pound for the tomatoes that they pick. A penny more. That's all that they're asking for. In California, we struggle to get rights for the, the workers who live in the labor camps. Where they live, there's no grocery store nearby. There's no buses nearby. Their kids are forced to leave the labor camps when they're not in picking season, and if they want to stay in school, they can't. Because in order to live in that labor camp, when they're not in season, they have to live 60 miles away from where that camp is. So what we try and do is ask people to be more aware when you talk about these things, and be more aware of where your food comes from, too. If you're vegan, we don't get a pass. Sure, we get a pass when we're talking about non-human animals, absolutely. And that's fantastic. That's what we should be encouraging everybody to strive for. But let's look at the whole picture of all of our food supply. How many times have people 
see publications in the vegan realm that say cruelty-free chocolate. Or, you know, somehow there's this, this belief system that because it's vegan equals cruelty-free. There are 1.8 million children in Ghana and the Ivory and yeah, Ghana and the Ivory Coast that are victims of the worst forms of child labor, all while picking cocoa for the chocolate industry. West Africa is entrenched in slavery, all for chocolate. You have children who are locked in at night, who are beaten or killed if they try to escape. They carry heavy cacao pods. And if they don't move fast enough while carrying these, they're beaten. These children get to these, these plantations for a variety of ways, which they come from very poor countries such as Mali and Burkina Faso, which is nearby. And they get there from either maybe, you know, very poor communities, right? So you have the fact that these people believe that their children are going to get paid. So the children go off to work in these cocoa fields thinking they're going to get paid. What happens is some of them don't come back. Worse, they're not paid at all for, you know, for the money to go back to the family for the sacrifice that they made. Other children are maybe sold by a family member into it, thinking that you know, they're going to get some money. You have children who are stolen from marketplaces in these areas. Human trafficking for chocolate, for an absolute and utter luxury that nobody needs to survive. Children, and actually even some older adults, are victims of this type of treatment. What our organization did on this is that we created a list of chocolates that we do and don't recommend based on where they're sourcing their cacao, based on where they're sourcing their chocolate from. As a vegan organization, our list is pretty much made up of any company on our list. You can be guaranteed they have to make something that's vegan. What's sad is that a lot of companies that haven't responded to us are vegan companies who don't want to tell us where their chocolate's coming from. We have a campaign right now against Cliff Bar because they won't disclose where their chocolate's coming from. If you're a social justice activist, you know from Nike to Apple that one of the best ways we were to get to get these corporations to change the conditions for the workers, although neither one of them is perfect, absolutely not, um, was by transparency. And yet Cliff Bar is denying us that transparency to find out where are they sourcing from. They think they're above us. We have a petition on our website. Over a thousand people have asked this question. They don't feel that they need to tell us. Somehow they think that slavery of children for chocolate is important enough that they don't need to respond to us. Well, if you're an activist like me, fuck that. <laughs> hey, down you better. <laughs> we have an app as well, and I don't have a little smartphone, but it only works on two of the kinds of smartphones. So underlying all of this is that oppression pretty much always goes with race and class. And as much as we would like to say in the United States, and I don't know how it is in Canada, we like to say that racism doesn't exist anymore, which is absolutely ludicrous. And I can't even tell you how many activists, animal rights activists, told me that and continue to tell me that. Um, and luckily, I'll hear Bruce later. Say, She's not one of them. And I know that it's not that different in Canada. And um, one of the things, the other things that we work on, and Patrice talked about, um, and I apologize that this is US centered, and so you know, way more than I do about this for here, but uh, is this intersectionality concept and how Food Empowerment Project has worked on this in this particular area is, um, I'm gonna back up a lot of it. You, many of you may or may have not heard, this is very common in the US, to say veganism is really easy, anybody can do it. It's not hard. And they, they also act as if it's only a matter about being able to access the food without understanding that it's a matter of access but it's also a matter of where these communities and where these peoples and what their lives are like. That you can't just say, I'm going to try this thing of um, eating vegan on food stamps or something like that without understanding people who maybe work two to three jobs. So maybe buying in bulk seems really great for those of us. It seems really cost efficient. But if you're working two to three jobs, do you have that much time to cook for dinner? Food and Primer Project works on um, access to healthy foods in communities of color and low income communities. And we do this, as Patricia was saying, as an intersectionality way of fighting two problems, right? You have that access to
to healthy foods is a privilege in the United States. And I've looked enough here to Canada to know for the, the First Nations people, indigenous people, it's, it's, it's not, it is a privilege as well. That these communities, indigenous communities, people of color in the United States, don't have the same access. It's not a right. It's, healthy food is not a right for us, as it should be. So what we do is we go to communities of color and we access, we, sorry, I'm just confused, access and assess, they're so close to me. We assess the availability of healthy foods. And we don't go into communities who don't want us. We go to communities that want us to do this work. We go in and we assess for availability of fresh fruit, produce, um, canned, frozen, as well as um, mock meats and dairy alternatives. And as an ethically based organization, we do this because first and foremost for every topic, every outreach that we do, is that we promote veganism because animals should not have to die, period. But we can't deny the benefits of a vegan diet. I don't try to, but we don't. We talk about the fact that everybody knows increase in fruits and vegetables is better for your health. Right? So these communities should be able to have access to fresh fruits and vegetables and also alternatives that if they choose to eat more ethically, to eat their ethics, then they should have access to these meat and dairy alternatives. You add on top of that that the majority of people of color were lactose intolerant. So why don't our communities have dairy alternatives? Why in fact do we have more dairy in our communities than non-dairy alternatives? They're trying to make us sick, frankly. We consider this a form of food apartheid, right? They're deliberately putting foods in our communities that are gonna make us sick. So we work on this. Um, we're just starting a new project in Vallejo, uh, California, which is not too far from San Francisco. And um, when we did our work in Santa Clara County, if you're familiar, Santa Clara County, it's where Apple's based, it's known as the Silicon Valley, it's where Google's based. We found that communities of color had 50% more liquor stores and meat stores than um, white, um, higher income communities. They also had 14 times more access to frozen vegetables than our communities did. Having people grow their own food, which I know is not, quite frankly, not available for everybody, as well as our communities is not available. Growing their own food, to me, is the ideal. Because then we're off that system. We're off a system that never worked for us to begin with. It's not a broken system. It never worked for people like me. The other thing from that, I, I'm learning that i got to be more positive about everything, not just sit here and go, oh my god, everything's over. But you know, cooperatives as well. You know, in our communities, if we can have cooperatives that are worker-based, that gives back to our communities. There's this big push about Walmart going into our communities and selling more fruits and vegetables, and isn't that a good thing? Well, no, it's not. I mean, poverty follows Walmart, for one thing. For another thing, that money leaves our communities. We need the money to stay in our communities so we can take care of ourselves. We can do it fine in a system that's made for equality for us. So part of the solution talks from having an empathy and understanding, speaking out against all forms of oppression, racism, sexism, homophobia, Etc. If you're like me, when I got involved in animal rights and the work that I did at Silicon Valley Toxics Coalition, when I learned about us dumping our electronic waste on developing countries, there's this burning sensation that I get, like, oh my God, we have to stop this injustice now. And with your food and with some of the things I talked about, there's a way we can do that. And we have to join together and fight to strike for justice. One of the things that I know, um, I say a lot, so I apologize if everybody gets like me saying this. I know Patrice and Mark are. But we need to shake the foundations of the establishments, establishments that have power, this type of perceived power over us. And one of the great leaders that we see, people think of in the United States is um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who most people are aware of his work in terms of the civil rights movement and the great strife. <laughs> um, the great strides that he made in the civil rights era. But what's not talked about as much, and I, quite frankly, I think this is done on purpose, 
is that what's not talked about a lot is his connections to other issues. That he was a vocal opponent against the Vietnam War. He was a vocal supporter of workers' rights. I mean, he spoke for the janitors. He was out on a campaign for janitors for justice. But these intersections of what he talked, why would they, why would they want to promote that he talked about these other issues? It doesn't serve their purpose. It, it serves their purpose, the powers that be, just to talk to him about him as a civil rights movement. But when you look about what he did, he brought all these issues together. And why? Because there's strength. When we combine our forces, when we recognize that all of this is absolutely together, we can not only shake these foundations that work to oppress, we can break them down. Thank you.